Good evening, everyone. Welcome, bienvenue, for a wonderful evening with Sandra Smith and Beth Gersnesset. Beth Gershnesek on Master of Souls by Irene Nemirovsky. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French every year, teaching people to learn French, live French, and love French with the Alliance Francaise. We have some great events coming up, so mark your calendar for Alain Le Nôtre, Chef Alain Le Nôtre, who's coming back, as well as Mutinous Women, America's French Roots, a wonderful celebration of Marcel Proust, Damien MacDonald on French Bon Dessiné, and again, some more of Chef Le Nôtre coming up, great recipes. So just a little bit of housekeeping, please stay on mute during the presentation and stay on speaker view. All questions will be in the chat and we'll make sure that we save time at the end for all the questions in the last 15 or so minutes. And if you have any issues, technically just sign out and sign back in again. And um, we want everyone to know that the event is being recorded for our YouTube channel and anyone signed up will receive that link and the total runtime will be one hour. So we're thrilled to have both Sandra Smith and Beth Gershnesik. Um, Sandra has translated 40 books into English, including 14 of Irene Nemirovsky's novels, notably the international sensation Suite Française. She has also translated Albert Camus, Guy de Maupassant, Simon de Beauvoir, and others. Sandra is the recipient of, recipient of numerous awards, including the National Jewish Book Award and the Penn Translation Prize. Beth Gersh, Susan Gershnesek is, is known by so many of us. She is an art historian and the director of the New York Arts Exchange. Her most recent book is a translation of so, Salmon expert, Dr. Jacqueline Gaujard's Pablo Picasso, André Saumon, the painter, the poet, and the portraits. Beth contributes to the online magazine, Bonjour Paris, which if, you, if you're not a member, you should be, it's fabulous. And she teaches art history at Mercy College. So Master of Souls, and I'll remind everybody at the end is, is I hope everybody's on everybody's buy list. It's a fascinating novel and it is available from your favorite bookseller. And we'll remind you at the end. Um, and I'm thrilled now to introduce Sandra and Beth. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. And Sandra, so we are here today to celebrate you and this fabulous book. Master of Souls. So let's begin. We want to give everybody just a little summary, a little bit of a taste. Would you like to start with the introduction to this beautiful and fascinating novel? Well, thanks for every, to everyone for coming this evening and also Beth for doing this and the Alliance Francaise. Uh, it's always fun to do things with Beth. <laughs> we usually end up spending more time than <laughs> we're allowed, but um, it's always fascinating. So, um, and really we're here not to celebrate me, but to celebrate Nemirovsky. She is an amazing, amazing writer. So I prepared a little PowerPoint presentation. So now I'm gonna share my screen and bear with me if there are any technical technical problem, but it should be okay. So I'm gonna do that now. Did that work? Yes, can you see that? Yes, we can see it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, good, right, okay. So I'll try and do this with my little person. So, uh, Nemirovsky wrote this between 1938 and 1939, and it was serialized in a literary magazine, which is called Gringoire, and that was between May and September of 1939. Um, some of you might know about the period, might um, automatically associate Gringoire with being extremely anti-Semitic, and I just want to stress that Nemirovsky published in this magazine before it became anti-Semitic. Um, it was published as a serial 
this was very common in the day. You know, you'd have one episode each week, et cetera. And then when it was put together, it was published as Les Echelles du Levant, the ports of the Levantine. And this was an allusion to the Middle East where the main characters, that's Dario and Clara Aspar, are from. Uh, but Nemorowski's initial title was intended to be Le Charlatan, The Charlatan. But it was eventually published as Le Maître des Armes, Master of Souls. That's what we have today. Okay, we're supposed to move. Oh, okay. Right. So without giving too much away, I don't know how many of you may have already read it or started reading it, but without giving too much away, um, Nemorowski presents us with a foreign doctor who is initially idealistic and very moral, but he's plagued by hunger and prejudice. He can't get clients because he's foreign and he's forced to lower himself to perform abortions, prescribe drugs, et cetera. And at the time, um, there was a law, I've skipped a bit, but you can see at the bottom of the slide, there was a law in France that was in force, the Cousin Nass Law of July 1935, which fortunately is no longer in force, which made it extremely difficult for foreigners to practice medicine. There were a lot of hoops to jump through. And his name, Asfar, actually means wanderer in Arabic. So symbolically, it represents, this character represents the plight of all immigrants who are rejected by many nations wherever they go. Now, the character of Darius, central character, so he's the most important one. He realizes that most people, most of his patients, have no real physical illness. They just have mental issues. And so this is a time in the 1920s and 30s when the theories of Freud and psychoanalysis are really exploding in France. Um, and so there was a great interest in this. And Dario becomes a psychoanalyst. And what he does is he scams wealthy people, wealthy snobs, by inventing a theory, which he calls the psychic theory, uh, in, in which, by which to manipulate people. And, you know, that way he becomes, he gets a great reputation and becomes rich. But unfortunately, he himself becomes addicted to wealth, status, and reputation. And so it's really a double-edged sword for Nemirovsky because while he's manipulating other people, he also, and, and playing on their addictions, he's also, it may, makes a trap for himself that he gets caught in. Now, some of these uh, events in the novel are reflections of actual events. So here's a couple of examples. There was a doctor named uh, Dr. Boubra, and he was imprisoned in 1927 for malpractice and for having uh, Bernard Grasset locked up. Um, say a bit about that in a sec. But uh, Grasset was the the real life model for the industrialist Philippe Wards in the novel. Now, um, some of you might recognize the name Grasset because of course it's the name of the big French publishing house. And this Bernard Grasset was indeed a member of this uh, family and whose sisters wanted to have him uh, ousted from the company and so claimed that he was insane, not of sane, sane mind, and got this uh, unscrupulous doctor to agree with them and lock him up. And so he had to go to court 
and uh, prove that he wasn't insane, which he did. He did prove that he was not insane. And so uh, the doctor was, uh, his reputation was gone and his sisters never managed to get him ousted from the company. There are a lot of ways to interpret this novel. Uh, there's lots of different levels. I mean, first of all, of course, there is the story itself, which I haven't even bothered to put on the screen because it's so obvious. Um, the story itself is so beautifully told with Nemirovsky's typical elegant style, complex characters. Nobody is two dimensional. You have characters who are symbolic and yet they still remain complex and three dimensional. Um, in, so the, another interpretation is the critique of the prejudice and desperation that immigrants face, but her real tour de force, I think in this novel is her ability to make us feel the palpable xenophobia of the time, but without an ounce of moralism. There is morality in the, in the novel, but she doesn't kind of hit us over the head with it. You know what I mean? Um, now, in her journals, she wrote that Dario's being a charlatan was a pretext to describe a cynical scammer who is the product of the hypocritical French society of the time. So that just gives you an idea of what she was thinking. Can also be seen as a fable because you have the starving lonely wolf. She uses this analogy in part of the novel who emerges from the forest and is forced to use his teeth to survive. Um, another one of her, I think one of her best novels is called The Dogs and the Wolves. And this theme uh, comes up again and again, how uh, prejudice, force and xenophobia force people back into their most bestial nature in order to survive. But it's also can be interpreted as the Faust legend because Dario figuratively sells his soul in order to gain wealth and status. This becomes his obsession, really. And he loses a lot of his morality and the things that mean the most to him. The reason why he's become this person, why he needs to be wealthy, why he needs to survive, but at the same time, he's losing the people who he, whom he cares about the most. So um, again, a quote from Nemorowski's journal, where she says, I'm not studying the stereotype of a charlatan. I'm digging beneath a label to find the things that interest me, that touch me. An unhappy childhood, hatred, love, then hatred of the bourgeoisie. So, Many of these themes we can see are appropriate today. This is what makes her work very universal. The way immigrants are treated, xenophobia, uh, abortion, which is, it's, it's kind of ironic that this is a, it's a very minor part of the novel. It happens right at the beginning where the doctor whose wife has just had a baby, has no money whatsoever and is begging his landlady to lend him money. And the only way that she, agree, she will agree to do it, I'm not giving too much away because this all happens like in the first two chapters, um, is to have him perform an abortion for his her son's wife because they can't afford to have any more children, they can't afford another mouth to feed. This of course is a very topical issue today. Uh, also the theme of social hypocrisy, the dog eat dog world and the addiction to wealth, power, influence, status 
and even sex and all of these themes. I mean, we can just look at the last, say, six or eight years. Um, and it's obvious that these themes are taken from real life. Okay, things to think about. There are several female characters and some of them, and they do co contrast with one another. So there's Clara, who is Dario's wife. There's Sylvie Wards, who's the wife of Philippe Wards, the industrialist. There's Eleanor. Eleanor is the, the wife of the landlady's son who has the abortion at the beginning, but she becomes a major character later on. And then there's the Russian general's wife and she's the landlady who becomes a money lender and uh, is the landlord of Dario and Clara. Then you can compare the male characters. There's Dario, there's Daniel who is his son, the Clara and Dario's son. There's Philip Wards, main characters, the, the big industrialist, and then a character named Martinelli. Martinelli is a maitre d' in one of the big hotels on the Côte d'Azur with Nice, and he's the one who gives Dario his break because he calls him when there are incidents in the hotel and they don't want a French doctor who knows these people particularly. Uh, so he calls Dario and Dario starts getting clients that way. And he becomes um, dependent on Martinelli, but that relationship changes by the end of the novel. So we have uh, virtuous people uh, versus the ones who represent vice and the ones who change or embody both characteristics at the same time. So those are things to think about um, if you're about to read the book or you haven't have already read the book. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I think we're back to you, Renee. Yes? Uh, yes. I guess I'm the next back, one. Back to bed. And so we had decided that you would read. Would you like to read one of the on page 22, 22 to 23? Okay. <clears throat> so this passage is, I, I feel, and I think Beth agrees with me, we picked this out together, um, really shows her style and how sensual her style is and also the, all of the contradictions and the themes that we've, that we've been mentioning. So this is Dario. He's come home from the hospital where Clara has had their son, Daniel, and he's starving. And he has no, no money, there's no food, and he goes back to his apartment and he looks out the window and this is what he sees. There was a little restaurant across the street. From his window, Dario saw the bright room and a few tables covered in long white tablecloths. Every now and then, one of the waiters went over to the window and picked up one of the prepared meals that sat in the window to entice the passers-by. Golden bread, peaches in a container, a cold spiky lobster, Italian wine in round bottles inside straw baskets. Then a man walking by, a woman on his arm, who stopped, pointed to the little restaurant sign with his cane. They went inside. They're going to have a good meal, thought Dario. He stood up and pressed his face against the window, but it formed a barrier between him and the sight of the food. He opened the window, leaned out. He tried to breathe in the aromas, that must surely be rising up from the basement window. Wonderful smells, of course. Hot soup, expensive butter, vegetables slowly browned and cooked in a stew pot, and meat. 
but the restaurant was too far away. All he breathed in was the perfume of crushed flowers that rose up and made him feel sick. On a bench below, a man and a woman were kissing in the dim light. Hunger mingled in Dario's body with other desires. He coveted meat and wine, bread and a woman, ripe juicy fruit in their soft bed, bare breasts whose paleness he thought he could make out as they suddenly appeared from the shadows. But the lovers stood up and went away. They held each other around the waist and staggered a little as they walked, as if they were slightly tipsy. Dario swore quietly. Why was life so subtle and delicious to other people? For him, life had the taste of raw, coarse food, food he had to seek out with difficulty, grasp with effort, sometimes even tear at with his teeth if it was impossible to get it any other way. Why? I think that's a brilliant passage. It is, it is brilliant and I'm glad you picked it out because one of the things that we notice right away, this is very early in the novel, is that he has appetite. And so she starts with food and she goes into his desire for sexuality and that becomes his undoing. So she sets it out very clearly for us. And then thank you for picking this one because it um, it also has her wonderful vocabulary, her precision and her evocative adjectives, expensive butter. And then of course you wonder, you know, what are we talking about there? He wants the best. So she's picking out a lot of things which go to his psychological frame of mind. And as I mentioned before, his, um, prodigious appetite, which is part of also the, the plot. So let's talk just, about his interject. characters. Sorry, before yes. we go on. And the thing I love about this passage also is the fact that the window, it's the symbol of the barrier between him and all of the things that other French people, that real French people are entitled to and enjoy. And he can't and he even tries opening the window. It's so symbolic that he opens it to try to, and lean out to try and be part of it. And all he can smell is the sickening roses or flowers that are decomposing. Uh, it's just so brilliantly understated, I think, and, and done. Indeed, she picks out the flowers, which seem to be, as, as you can imagine, of beauty, which is now in decay. And we know, to remind everybody, that Nemirovsky is an immigrant. So this is the position that she is trying to explain. I think this is coming, it's visceral. It's coming from, from that sense of no matter how long she stays in Paris and knows French fluently, she's always an outsider, which is, of course, part of the immigrant experience. So it really is very, I think, sympathetic. And there we are, beginning sympathetically. Well, it is part of her, his, her own history. I mean, she was born in um, Kiev, which was then Russia, and hopefully won't be Russia again, but um, in 1903. And the family had to, uh, it was very unusual at the time because they were a Jewish family. Her father was a wealthy banker, which was usually not allowed, but he was in with the czar. And so they were allowed to live in a good part of town and be wealthy and have influence. And then when the Russian Revolution started in 1917, they were considered white Russian and they had to flee. So they went first to um, Sweden. She was an amazing linguist, by the way. She was brought up really speaking French as her first language because the upper classes at, in, in Russia at the time spoke French, it was considered you know, it was the language of diplomats and uh, the upper classes and high society. So she had a French governor. So French was her first language and Russian. And she learned English and she studied the classics, of course. So when she went, they went to Sweden for a year, she learned Swedish. And then they went to Finland for a year and she learned Finnish. And then 
ended up in Paris at the age of 16 and did her degree at the Sorbonne in French and Russian literature. And you can really see the influence of both Russian and French writers in her works, in all of her works. But she did have these, the, the experience of being an immigrant. Her first novel written in 1929, the first published novel was David Golder. And it's a story about Russian immigrants, her parents basically, and their daughter who go to France, again, to Nice. They spent a lot of time in Nice. They used to go on their vacations to Nice. And um, she describes basically the catch 22 of Jewish immigrants in France in this novel, because in order to be accepted, you had to be wealthy. But then if you were wealthy, all the stereotype prejudice came out of the rich Jews trying to control everything. So it was really a catch-22 situation. And, um, you know, it's, it's a very evocative novel, I think, of the prejudice. And as you noticed, Beth, because you, you told me you were reading it, the beginning of David Golder and the beginning of this novel are the same. It starts with no, both of them. So immediately you have this rejection. Yes, that's an interesting way of putting that. There's a rejection because one of the things about Nemirovsky and I wanted to ask you about Nemirovsky in, in terms of this sort of landscape of different novels, but just to say this, that is true. You feel she gets to it right away. She, pow and the kisser. She's not one of these people who lays out a very long landscape or context and you have to wait until you're on page two to figure out where you're going. This one, she just catches you by the, the collar, you know, up close <laughs> and you think, oh, my God. And, and, and when you think, of course, that Russian literature was her influence, you think right away that, oh, oh there might be a murder here. But uh, don't worry. <laughs> um, no spoilers. What I wanted to get to, of course, is women. We've talked about her female characters. They're really complicated. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about what you've seen as common denominators among the women that are in most of the novels you've translated so far? 14? <laughs> yeah, it's a and lot. short stories included. Yes. Yes. Um, no, not included. <laughs> short story, not included. So, so the, the, so the, um, David Golder and Snow's Snow and Autumn. Well, what is the ball that, a novella? Snow, Snow and Autumn are like novellas. And novellas. They, published well, let's in call novella. they, are, they were published in one edition. But um, there were so many, so many influences. But these female characters, they tend to be very complicated and you feel sympathy for them, but some of them are really awful. I mean, they're really mean and vicious. And in David Golder, for example, the mother, her mother, um, has a lover, has a living lover while her father's away, you know, earning the money. Um, and in this novel, it's kind of reversed because it's Philippe Wards who has the mistresses while the wife is, is a saint. I mean, she's, she is absolutely idolized by Dario and then, and then by his son. And she has a daughter as well, who's, you know, is, is very virtuous and kind and generous. Where, and Clara also, his wife, fits into that category. She will, well, they've met his children, basically. I think 15, she says, they were 15 when they, they ran away together to get away from their poverty and try to go to France and make a better life. Um, and she's absolutely devoted to him. And he is also devoted to her, even though he behaves very badly by most standards towards her, and towards the um, middle, when he's once he's very wealthy, he becomes addicted to, basically to sex, to having mistresses and 
Um, but she knows, she knows and she doesn't mind because she loves him so much and she knows that this is necessary for him to advance. And all she wants is his success. And, you know, it turns out that at one point, which I'm not gonna give away to any spoilers, but at one very moving point in the novel, he says to her, you know, you're the only woman I've ever really loved. And he means it. He does mean it. Doesn't act like it, but he means it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And the same with the male characters. Uh, you, you see that some of them are almost, but no one's three, no one's two dimensional. But you take someone like Philippe Ward, who basically the villain in the piece. Um, he's selfish. He's egotistical. He's mean. He cares about nothing but himself and his reputation, his status. And he's one of the people whom Dario manipulates. And so there's a reversal in the... This happens a lot with Nemirovsky. There, you start out with certain characters being strong and they end up the weaker ones at the end. And the ones who seem weak are actually the stronger ones. And I think you and I talked about this one day, didn't we? About how there seems to be an inverse relationship in Nemirovsky's characters, that the stronger you are morally, the more frail you are, fragile you are physically, and the opposite, it's all these big, strong, strapping men and you know the, the athletic women and who, who's, who really have no morals. So it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that goes on. And you do see the shift really in the power structure often with her characters, so. This is true. We had talked about she has a wonderful way of describing people physically, although she leaves you with a sense of using your own imagination. So there, so there's some physical attributes, but what I noticed, I told Sandra before we started this program this evening, was that I saw the cover of the French novel and I found it very interesting because it had a sort of 1930s dapper fellow with a top hat and looked like he was wearing you know, the tails with the white tie. So it gives you a sense that in France, at the time that this was published, they imagined that would have been the main character. But when I was reading the novel, I didn't see him that way. I, I saw him um, as a bit more exotic looking. She seems to... I think, as I recall, emphasized the exoticism of his appearance, which ends up, as we talk about Im immigrants and racism here, as being the thing which he feels is the obstacle, the, that people see him in a crowd and right away feel that he's an other, and this is his struggle in order to overcome what are his uh, deficits at this point, but he starts out poor, we've pointed that out. You want to see how he's going to uh, overcome what is his poverty, a really a very sad and very disturbing poverty as well, because he has a, an infant son at the very beginning. And so just, just as yes. um, yeah, just as we were saying, the the way to make to become successful as an immigrant, the way to overcome the poverty was to overcome the prejudice. And the only way to overcome the prejudice is by being wealthy. So you're caught in this vicious circle of, you know, he manages it. He manages to become wealthy. Does he ever really get past the prejudice? She doesn't actually make that clear. Because Dr. Well, would... Eleanor, Eleanor is, you know, I should have said this when I did the slides. Eleanor is American. She's not French. The general's wife is Russian. She's not French. The two main characters are from the Levantine. The only really French 
characters are Wards and his wife, Sylvie. They are, and even Martinelli is in French. He's of Italian descent. So, you know, there's this very complex intertwining of relationships. But as you're saying, the physical does come into it a lot with Nemirovsky. And she describes, you know, da even Dario describes how it's his ears and his big ears and his hair and, you know, his, his face, the way his big nose. And this is what puts people off. This is why he's, he's always going to be looked at as foreign even though he's been in France for 10 years and is, has all his qualifications as a doctor. And he's a good doctor, but no one wants him as a doctor until he takes on the hypocrisy of the society, the French society, to become a psychiatrist and a master of souls. That's right. And also he, has, he corners the market on people this is interesting too, that's contemporary, who, who feel as though they have these anxieties. They they are feeling that they need to be fixed, that they there has to be something that ha can be done. And they're looking for a person to help them feel more comfortable. This is This is the reason why they become his regular patients because they feel as though they're making progress and he's convincing them that they must stick with him in order to make more progress. We've, we've seen this before. But, uh -huh. and this I think is something that's, it's subtle. I mean, it's, it's only in a, it's in a couple of lines in the book, but to me it's extremely important where Dario realizes that what his patients want is basically to indulge their obsessions and their addictions without paying the price. That's what they want him to help. That's the help that they want from him. Let me gamble. I mean, Philippe Ward says this to him. Oh yeah, all the doctors say the same thing to me. You're gonna just tell me, oh, stop gambling, stop you know, sleeping with women, stop you know, doing all these things, stop drinking. Well, then I'm not who I am. I'm another person. So he dismisses all that. What he wants is absolution. He wants someone to say, you're okay. Yeah, go ahead. Do these things. Just, I'm going to teach you how to handle it. I'm not going to try and cure you. But he passes it off as a cure. And we see also that there are still these anxieties which continue. In, in the other part of the book, a lot of this is quite contemporary, talking about people dealing with anxieties. So I think it's quite remarkable. This is 1938, 39, and yeah. still, and it's published thankfully today, um, that you know we can appreciate some of these issues in retrospect as well as contextually uh, today in the past. Um, the time is running out, so I do want to ask you a crucial question. Are you going to be translating any more Nemirovsky books? But not in the, not that I know of in the near future, but um, there are more. I think we've kind of done quite a lot, but I want to thank Kenneth Kales, Kales Press for, I think you're here, aren't you, Kenneth, um, for giving me the opportunity to translate this and The Prodigal Child, which we did uh, last year, because uh, I absolutely adore Nemirovsky. Mind you, there are about 200 short stories she wrote as well. So I don't know, maybe if I ever retire, <laughs> I might uh, pick some out and do a, a collection. There are a couple of collections in existence already. And I have actually translated a couple of her short stories. One of them is called um, The Virgins, quite interesting. And um, the other one is called We Once Were Happy. And they're both about relationships. And yeah, very interesting. You helped with the screenplay for Sweet Francaise. Are there any other 
No, um, I didn't. No, I didn't help with the screenplay for Sweet Fonzie. Not with the screenplay, but with, they. I, they I, I consulted. You. I consulted on the script for some of the BBC uh, radio plays that were made. Yeah, but that was very any, interesting. Are there any uh, novels in the pipeline for dramatization? We have the plays, but anyone picking this up for movie scripts? Well, I I am in touch with um, a scriptwriter at the moment who has written a script of The Dogs and the Wolves. Aha. Uh -huh. And I've read it and I think it's terrific. I think it's really terrific. The end is absolutely chilling. I just, I had goosebumps at the end. And he's now, um, we're in negotiation because I own the dramatization rights in English and he's um, shopping, they call it shopping it. To, to find producers uh, to make a movie of it. Yeah. Well, that's and great. It will be made in English. Yeah. Because when I'm reading this book, I certainly see a movie. I see a very fascinating movie. And uh, also because of the fact that the ambiance at, at times is really quite, quite plush, you know, it really, it would give a movie screen. Well, you know, David Golda was made into a movie. Did you know that? David Golda was made into a movie in 1930. Tell me about this one. And, um, gosh, I'm going to forget the names now. Uh, Harry Bauer played the lead. This is a very sad tale. Harry Bauer played the lead as David Golda. And then during the occupation, um, it wasn't 1930, it was published in 1929. It, the English came out in 1930. And then I think it was in, in the mid thirties, must've been the mid thirties that the movie was made. And during the occupation, because Harry Bauer played the lead of David Golder, the Nazis thought he was Jewish and he was actually arrested and tortured and died, even though he was not Jewish Isn't because he played the role. It's in, 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 incredible. And I it think is. this is also a movie of Labal, the ball. Aha. Uh -huh. The movie of Labal. And I think about 10 years ago, maybe there was a, someone did an adaptation in France of one of the, might have been Labal again as an opera. <gasps> so I have to look that up because I'm not 100% sure. But yes, I mean, they're, they're vivid, you know, they're visual. And this, I think, is very much the influence of the French and Russian writers who she adored. Yes, you can feel them. You you can really, especially if you have you remember your Dostoevsky, and then also there's a feeling, really, with the Prodigal Child of those fairy tales, those folk tales. And these are sort of modernizations with the novels that she creates with still that, for me, the, the kind of textures, the, the sensibilities, which we usually find when we're thinking about the moralizing of folk tales and fairy tales and you know that sort of a, a situation. But they do, I just feel as though she's influenced by the cinematic, the, the, the sense, of what could be if they are turned into movies because clearly uh, when she was writing these things movies had taken off and become a very popular uh, pastime well it's very interesting you say that because a couple of the uh, short story what short stories i translated uh, were one in particular was called noel christmas story and um it's part of a collection that she wrote which is called film parle and she wrote them as film scripts, these oh. short stories. And there are stage directions in the short story. So for so those of you- very interested. She was aware and very interested in the cinema. So for those people who have not heard about Irene, Irene uh, Nemirovsky before, please remind everybody that she was arrested during the Holocaust and her life was cut short. Yeah, she was, so, she was killed at Auschwitz. She was killed at Auschwitz. Did she die um, because she had been gassed or did she die from a, do we know? Or did she well, die from disease? In theory, it was typhus. 
but you don't know. We don't know about what the records show. Um, in her, well, let me let me try and do this quickly. Her, she and and her family converted to Catholicism in in September of 1939. Um, and when her, I became very friendly, I was so fortunate to know her daughter, Denise Epstein. And when Sweet Frances first came out, we did book tours together and I interpreted for her and got to know her extremely well. And I think the greatest compliment I've ever been given was when Denise said that she considered me part of the family. I just, you know, I was so moved by that. And, you know, she, Sorry. So they, when Denise was asked about the conversion, she said it was September, 1939. We didn't need another reason. They didn't know that the, the Nazis were going to go by bloodline. They didn't care about conversions. It was bloodline. If you had one Jewish, one Jewish grandparent, you were considered Jewish. That was the laws of 1940. So even though they converted, when they were living in the little village of E.C. Levesque, they had to wear the yellow star. And they did wear the yellow star. And Denise still thinks that they were, well, always thought that they were denounced. But she was very famous. She had been publishing a novel and short stories every year. And they moved to this little village to because they weren't basically allowed to work. She wasn't allowed to publish because she was Jewish. And all of the books that were already out there for sale, the royalties were put into black, what they called black accounts for the Nazis, took the, the royalties. And the only way they survived was the publisher, Alba Michel, actually used her, one of her friends who was Catholic, pseudonym, to publish and give the money to the family through that woman, through the friend. Um, and her husband was a banker and he wasn't allowed to work. But, you know, she was very daring. They went to church every Sunday in this little village wearing the yellow stars. So, and Denise recalls, you know, recalled that they had never been brought up as observant but in interviews, when David Golder came out, she was accused of being anti-Semitic because of the harsh portrayal of these characters. And she says in this, in this interview, this radio interview she gave in 1929, she actually says, I'm Jewish and proud of it. And I'll tell anyone who asks, I don't know what the fuss is about. I just wrote a story about mom and papa, <laughs> which... <laughs> was quite a story. So, yeah, she was uh, deported. And then her husband wrote letter after letter after letter to all these influential people who were friends of theirs from the literary circles to try and find out first where she was, then to try and exchange himself for her because he said he could do the work that they were thought they were told they were labor camps. And by the time he wrote that letter, she is, was already dead. He didn't know that it was six weeks. She only survived six weeks. Um, and then because he had made such a fuss, he was arrested and he was gassed immediately on arrival at Auschwitz. So, yeah. Um, but seeing the way she writes, if she had survived the war, it's, it's, I just can't imagine what powerful thing she would have written. It's such a waste, such a shame. Absolutely. Yes. So I wanted to remind people if they haven't heard of her before. I think we should ask. She gets some questions. Yes. Yes. My favorite I think it's time for questions. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the chat. Um, would you kindly speak about translating, okay, in general, and this book in particular, translating 
What would you like to say, Sandra, about translating? <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> it, is yeah. a, it is a skill. Um, the role of the translator has changed dramatically uh, since the beginning, uh, I would say, since the 20th century. Some early things, the translator is not even credited. You know, you don't know it's written. It was translated, or if you know it's translated, you don't know by whom. Um, with Nemirovsky, I always love translating Nemirovsky because I've done so many, and even though they're all different, there's still a core of her writing and her style and her rhythms that that come up again and again. So in a way that that makes it, you know, a, a little bit easier to translate. Um, I wasn't going to share this, but I think I will now since I've been asked the question. I had an, I won't name names, but I had a phone conversation with someone yesterday, in fact, uh, talking about some rights to something I had translated and saying that they, they normally share the royalties between the author and the translator. And I said, yes, but all of these things are in the public domain now. So I am basically the author. So I should have the author's share. And this woman said to me, but you're just the translator. And I took great offense at this and said, just? <laughs> to which she said, oh, oh, no, I didn't mean it that way. But of course, it's exactly how she meant it. And I think this is, you know, this is changing now. People are recognizing that we are authors, that we are writers. Um, one of my friends, a fabulous translator, Rob Schwartz, who's uh, English, she um, did a lot of commercial work at the beginning, you know, the bread and butter work. And she told, this, she told me this story about how once someone faxed her 10 pages of commercial stuff and phoned her to say, did you receive the 10 pages? And she said, yes. And they asked her how long it would take her to type it in English. And that was their idea of translating. You just typed it in English. Um, so I really love translating. I think it's very challenging. There have been a couple of things I've translated that were really, really difficult and I have not enjoyed. I have to be honest, um, mainly nonfiction things. But um, on the whole, I just feel very fortunate. So what's the other? What's so that was one way? of the things, what was the biggest challenge? Do you want to answer that specifically? You said some things are challenging. Do you want to pick out one ex example that you found was particularly a challenge? She has wonderful rhythm. Mm. she's very very lyrical and that is the biggest challenge is trying to replicate that rhythm in English I mean you, you can't do it exactly but to try and get the same like the equivalent I'm always telling my students when I, I teach translation um, don't translate what it says translate what it means and that way you can get more, it's easier to get more of the rhythm once you get away from this literal word for word translation, which just never works. It just never works, I think. So yeah, I think the lyricism is the most challenging part. We've also said humor. Sometimes humor also, you, it's, you have to translate something not as it literally is, but in an equivalent to what the target language would un, people who read the target language would consider that's always yes. you know a discussion about how you might have to choose something that is a completely different paradigm in order for people to right. see what that is so those are challenges well i can give you one yeah. example it was quite funny actually um in one book i translated uh there's a scene where a main character is reading the bible um, in secret, she's got the cover on it because she's trying to help a friend who's a priest get more people come to his church. 
and she takes it on. She's in marketing and she's an atheist, but she takes it on as a marketing job. Um, and she doesn't want people to know that she's actually reading the Bible. So she's got a cover on it about economics or law or something. And in the background, the radio is playing. And on the radio, there's a comedy scene. And it's a sketch between two very, very famous French comedians about a train ticket and a train journey. I asked some French friends about it. And they said, oh, they knew who it was immediately, immediately. And so I contacted the author. For change, I was translating someone alive, which was nice. And I said, you know, Laurent, what are we going to do about this scene? Because it's not going to mean anything to American audience. It's going to make no sense to an English-speaking audience to have this thing in the background. They're going to miss the irony, the contrast between the seriousness and this comedy going on in the background. They're just not going to get it. So either we have to find an equivalent or we have to leave that scene out. We have to leave those lines out. You're the author, what do you want to do? And he said, well, if you can find an equivalent, let's go for that. So I thought about it and I came up with the Monty Pipe and Dead Parrot sketch. And that is what we used. We, they got the permissions and it was only a few lines anyway. But, you know, she's reading about She's reading about mortality and death in the Bible. And in the background, it's like, this parrot is deceased, <laughs> you know? So it worked. It worked that way. But it's very hard. Very hard to sometimes find those equivalents. Um, and yeah. Okay. Oh. That, that's yeah. exactly what I was hoping for. One of those things when it's equivalents. Um, where and when did you acquire your French? I had a French teacher in high school who I absolutely adored. And it was, she was the one who inspired me. I knew from high school that I wanted to teach French. And I majored in uh, comparative, matter, ma comparative modern languages, French, Spanish, German, as an undergraduate. But then when I had a chance to go to France for my junior year abroad, I changed to straight French. So I lived in France for a year. And then I came back and got my BA. And then I went back to get my MA at the Sorbonne with NYU and lived there again. And then, of course, when I lived in England, which was until about eight years ago, um, I went there as a student and stayed. It was so close to France that I could go, you know, often on hop on the Eurostar when it was built. Um, and so basically, that is how I acquire the French. And, you know, I still, I still love the language a lot. I think it's a beautiful language. So. Yes, so it Corey, is. Corey's asking about my and process. And then your process. Do you want to talk about your process? How many drafts? How many drafts do you, how do you know when it's done? It's ah, never that's done. That's a very good question. <laughs> how do you know when it's done? It's, well, it's my it's my process, um, like, for example, with the project I'm working on now, that's going to take three years. Um, I do two or three pages a day. I get something down. I underline things that I know I want to come back to. But I just got to get something down first. Then after I've done about, I'd say, 10 pages, I go back and read it just in English. And I do the research I have to, or, and I, 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 I basically work as my own editor. I edit what I've written. I rearrange sentences or clauses. Um, I read it out loud to hear, you know, the rhythms to, to make sure it sounds the way I want it to sound. And then, um, I, then I move on. If I, there are things that I don't know, I'm very fortunate because I have a whole network of French speaking, in French and English speaking people in France whom I can ask questions of. And if they don't know it in English, they'll explain it in French and that helps me. Um, and then of course you have your editors. Uh, it's very rare these days to have an editor who speaks the language that you're translating from. So uh, most editors are not comparing your translation to the original. Most editors are 
reading it in English the way American English readers are going to read it. And so that's, so they do the edits and then we go back and forth um, and decide, you know, most, most of the time the editor's comments are really helpful. And we agree on those changes. Sometimes uh, if I'm not really happy, I'll suggest the third option and we agree on that. So I'm very lucky because I, I've been, I've always had good, on the whole, I've had good relationships with my editors. So that works out. And then, you know, how do you know when it's done? I mean, I still, Corey, I still pick up things I've read. And I say, I would have changed that word, you know. Um, it's a bit like uh, dancing is one of my hobbies. And it's a bit like dancing. You know, it can all, you can always be better. And that's kind of the feeling that you get. And I'm sure that authors feel the same way. People who write whatever they write, short stories or novels or plays, that you go back and you think, hmm, maybe I should use this word. <laughs> but um, it is. Renee, do we have time for one more question? Oh, yes. We do. I see there's one more in the chat. Yes. Thank okay, you. Because it's eight o'clock. Um, so thank you for doing the translations. How on earth can you get through the writing? Cursive. I arrived. So she, uh, um, this is Maureen arrived late. Um, everything's typed. Yes. When you're when you get the manuscript to translate, I get the I get the PDF. Yeah. So I get, get it all done. So but I think it, may, Maureen may be letter. thinking of Sweet Frances, where she wrote it in this tiny, tiny uh, handwriting because she didn't have a lot of pen, a lot of ink and paper. And of course, it was her daughter, um, Denise, who became an archivist, actually, she was a librarian archivist. She actually uh, went through and wrote everything down from her mother's handwriting. So, I mean, the only other cursive I've had to do is when I translated the Simone de Beauvoir, Inseparable, there were some letters there that were in the in the original handwriting and that I seem to be okay. So good question. And so taking note, thanks. Um thank you, Corey. Uh, any other questions? All right. So let's just see that book again. Yeah, yes. everyone. Yes. So so first of all, let's thank let's thank Sandra for for bringing these books to all of us who may not have read them in French. To, oh, to bring the you. art of translation and sharing this incredible author with all of us. I think many of us in this group have read her books and thanks to you. Thank thanks you to the so translator. <laughs> and Kenneth, so Kenneth much. Kales, he does because he is the publisher. We need publishers. Otherwise, nothing gets out. Exactly. So, so everyone you. needs to buy the book at their at their local bookstore or wherever you buy books. It's readily available. And Kenneth, I think Kenneth told me that it is readily available at, at your favorite bookseller. So so please indulge yourself. Um, I think Beth and I both read the book once or twice. And um, it, it's very, very rich. It's wonderfully descriptive. And again, thank you to Sandra for sharing this great author with your translation. Oh, thank you all so much. I really enjoy doing this. And we look forward to the next. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Everybody give, give Sandra a big round of applause. I'm giving you all a big hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.